it, uh, welcome to St. Martin's University. Uh, this is Constitution Day 2019. Uh, the program is going to be first, we're going to show this excellent video that was done by Professor Dustin Zimmel, narrated by Professor Will Staver, and that will kind of set the tone of what we're going to be talking about today, which is freedom of speech, freedom of the press in the age of Trump and Assange. So without further ado, we're going to start that. Constitution Day commemorates the formation and signing of the U.S. Constitution by 39 brave men on September 17, 1787. This date also recognizes the citizenship of all those born in the U.S., as well as those who have become citizens through naturalization. We celebrate Constitution Day on this day each year because it is the date on which delegates to the Constitutional Convention signed this living document, which represents the core of American democracy and system of government. The focus of this year's Constitution Day event at St. Martin's is on the First Amendment to the Constitution. While all Americans at some point learn about the Constitution and its first ten amendments, known as the Bill of Rights, many of us don't know enough about its contents or think about the importance it carries to our daily lives. Each year, the Freedom Forum Institute conducts a survey of Americans to reveal their familiarity with the First Amendment. According to the results from their most recent survey, only 64% of Americans correctly identified freedom of speech, only 29% of Americans correctly identified freedom of religion, and only 22% correctly identified freedom of the press. To see how local residents compare, we asked a sample of students, faculty, and staff at St. Martin's University some questions about the First Amendment. Can you name the specific rights guaranteed by the First Amendment to the Constitution? So the First Amendment of the Constitution, I believe, guarantees the right of free speech. Freedom of assembly, freedom of religion. The freedom of getting people together as a thing. <laughs> what does the phrase freedom of the press mean to you? Being able to speak uh, like on social media and on other like social platforms. A press that's not controlled by the government. To openly like give out commentary or um, or just like report facts. To provide uh, as much information to help inform the citizens of the United States of America. Do you think the spread of fake news and misinformation on the internet is a serious threat to our democracy? I think what it's doing is shaping attitudes about democracy. It's reshaping um, attitudes about rights. Of course fake news is and fake, you know, things getting spread around is bad in the sense of trying to warn people or trying to communicate with people. Yeah, that's a, it's a big threat, bigger now than it was. Should journalists be prohibited from reporting information that the government doesn't like or agree with? Sometimes, like, things are going to happen, like the Watergate scandal or something might happen that the government might not want us to know about, but the press is what's going to get out there and let us know what's happening. Citizens need to make informed decisions. Um, well, if the government is restricting that flow of information, then it, it's cutting off the possibility of democratic participation. What is WikiLeaks? I don't know what that is. <laughs> WikiLeaks? That's like Wikipedia, right? Uh, it sounds like something like that would leak important information. WikiLeaks, is that the, that was the, um, what's his name? And I believe it is a kind of a rogue institution that seeks out private information. Didn't they have access to a bunch of, like, uh, I want to say hidden content, and then they made it public. From my understanding, WikiLeaks is a site where uh, a gentleman has gone through the process of digging up information that the government really doesn't want to be shared. Do you know who this is? He looks important. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you, having you just said WikiLeaks, I, I may have a guess, but no, actually, I really don't know who that person is. Is that Julian Assange? Yeah, I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> so why should we care about freedom of the press? 
In recent years, whistleblowers have been increasingly prosecuted for leaking government and classified documents to the media. Journalists have faced threats of prosecution and been increasingly stopped and searched at U.S. borders, and some have even faced arrest for failing to reveal sources or for covering stories involving protests, such as those in Ferguson, Missouri, and Standing Rock Indian Reservations in North and South Dakota. A recent high-profile case has raised concern amongst First Amendment advocates on both sides of the political spectrum because the Justice Department recently announced charges against Julian Assange, the founder and editor of WikiLeaks, an organization dedicated to publishing large data sets of censored or otherwise restricted official materials involving war, spying, and corruption. In today's hyper-polarized environment of political and social discourse, it is important for all Americans to critically examine why the First Amendment is important and how press freedom, in particular, has shaped our American society. Today's Constitution Day event is intended to highlight a commonly undervalued and misunderstood element of the First Amendment, that is, freedom of the press. We've convened some of the great scholarly, legal, and press minds from our local community to explore this topic more thoroughly and discuss the current state of freedom of the press in our country. Professor Will Stadler. So uh, what we're going to do now, I'm going to shift over to um, uh, just a set of PowerPoints, and I know my students will attest death by PowerPoint is probably the worst way to go. So we're going to we're going to have a discussion, and we, we want to engage you as part of this discussion. And the PowerPoints are just merely intended to provide a structure. So um, let me set that up, and then we're going to do the introductions and kind of rock and roll uh, through the. Uh, All right, so my name is Sean Newman. I'm a full-time instructor here at St. Martin's University. My undergrad is in labor law from uh, Ohio State University, and I law school, a uh, small school called Notre Dame. Uh, I've been an assistant attorney general. I've been uh, counsel to in institutions, and um, I'm happy to be here and happy to share my information with you. Uh. Good evening, I'm Ernesto Chavez. I teach uh, legal studies and criminal justice as well as philosophy at St. Martin's University. Um, I've also done some pre-law advising for UW-Tacoma and I've been teaching uh, in academia for about uh, seven and a half years, eight years going on, um, most of it at St. Martin's and one year at UW-Tacoma. And before my life in academia, I was a criminal defense attorney for uh, upwards of 14 years. And my experience with the First Amendment is through media relations with the press during my cases. My name is Bob Partlow, and uh, for 27 years I worked under the uh, umbrella of the First Amendment, uh, freedom of the press. Um, I was a reporter, um, first a radio reporter, and then for many years a newspaper reporter, worked for the Olympia and the Bellingham Herald, uh, covered mostly government, state uh, government and politics, and I did a lot of investigative work as well and um, worked with a lot of whistleblowers and a lot of people that provided me with so-called leaked information. Um, and uh, so I worked, covered the legislature and that was primarily the, the sort of, that was a, a target rich environment for a, an investigative reporter. And um, so I, I did that for 17 years and. I finally had basically had enough, and uh, so I moved on. I worked for the state for 11 years in foster care work, and then I retired in 2013, and um, I'm still writing. I did a newsletter for the state for a number of years, and I'm doing another newsletter for a local organization now. And uh, so that's uh, primarily what I do. I also do Santa. So there you go. <laughs> what can I say? It's all good. You know. Santa Bob. Santa, that's it. And uh, I help put on a camp for uh, foster kids who are separated from their siblings uh, because they are in different foster care placements. So my life is busy, but I really, my heart is still with, you know, with the, the, the press issues and being a reporter and, and all that. So, and there are really, there are times when I really do miss it because 
the state of affairs of the press is in pretty sad state right now and kind of wish I was back there sometimes. I'm David Price. I'm professor of anthropology and sociology here at St. Martin's University. Um, a lot of my research, anthropological research, deals with the history of the social sciences, history of anthropology, using the Freedom of Information Act. So I, for the last more than two decades, um, almost a quarter century, um, I filed, I don't know, I lost track in the 700s, probably you know, well over a thousand Freedom of Information Act requests. Uh, for documents from the FBI, CIA, uh, different, you know, different governmental bodies uh, relating mostly to anthropologists doing intelligence work or being involved around the fringes uh, of uh, intelligence activity. Uh, and some of this work has also involved uh, WikiLeaks. I've been part of a, a press group that, when they receive documents, gets an embargoed copy of things. Uh, to, to write up uh, and be ready for when the, the release date comes. So I, I know a bit about uh, some of the history of WikiLeaks and what goes on with it. All right, so uh, we're going to try to start. Uh, we, we intend to take a break. Uh, I want to thank, I meant to thank TCTV and Deb Venzel. They're going to be broadcasting this later on, but they're filming the, um, the event. and. But we ask you to please turn off your cell phones uh, so we don't have any distractions. Um, all right, so <coughs> I'm to blame for these slides, but we, we, uh, we look at, we begin with the language of the Constitution. Now, uh, uh, Professor Stadler has provided um, these free uh, constitutions. They're over here. If you don't have one, get one, hand it out to your friends. Uh, but we look at the language of the First Amendment, and it says, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion, prohibiting the free exercise, etc., or abridging freedom of speech or of the press. So that's the focus of today. Now, a couple of things. The first ten amendments refer to Congress. So those are restrictions the federal government has on your freedoms, your liberties, right? So. The Tenth Amendment says if it's not covered by the U.S. Constitution, the states can do what they want to do. The states often add rights uh, that, uh, to the Tenth Amendment, the, uh, the uh, First Amendment, and the First Ten Amendments, and, the, and that's true in the state of Washington. We have uh, a section in our state constitution that refers to freedom of speech, which says every person may speak freely, right and publish on all subjects being responsible for the abuse of that right. Now that's pretty straightforward and that'll become more relevant as we move further uh, through, the, um, through these PowerPoints. Um, uh, Professor Chavez and I talked about this concept of speech. My students know that law is a language and, and so when someone says speech, what does it mean? What, what is speech? What isn't speech? You want to address that? It's right back. Well, the first thing you want to note is the, the broad nature of what the language encompasses, its scope. I mean, it says basically for, for speech and press, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. I mean, look at the logic of that. Congress shall make no law. Uh, and what that means is there are very few exceptions, and speech can be many things. Uh, speech can be words. It can be... Uh, descriptions, images, advertisements, commercial speech, um, uh, anything that's an expression essentially. Uh, so Congress chose that language, speech, to be broad language and also Congress shall make no law. Uh, it, it, it implies that whatever speech is is very broad and that Congress shall almost make no law abridging it. So it's a very broad right. If you guys want to chime in, go ahead. But the, the, there are certain things that aren't speech, uh, the, and, and uh, the U.S. Supreme Court has, has made this, uh, made a number of rulings, and, and again, this goes to the language. Speech does not include incitement, like an incitement to riot, right? Speech does not, is hate speech uh, speech? Is that protected uh, uh, from government action? What about defamation? You see that recently in the news with respect to uh, Justice Kavanaugh and the, this new article that came out about him in the New York Times. Uh, is it, what about whistleblowers? Bob mentioned that um, 
He has worked a lot with whistleblowers. I've worked with Bob on some of that. Are they protected? There are some statutes that do protect whistleblowers. Obscenity, the famous case, I forget Justice Brennan or someone said, I know it when I see it. You know, what is obscenity? You know, fraud, that's not protected. Uh, fighting words, what is that? You may have heard of the famous uh, uh, statement, you, you know, it's, you, you can't yell fire in a theater, right? Uh, that's not protected speech because that's kind of an incitement. And uh, Ernesto mentioned commercial speech. That's given less protection uh, than other speech. But I think it's important to understand that when we talk about the press, and Bob and I talked about this part of, obviously, this presentation, what is the press? What is the press? Bob, do you want to take that? Well, the press, as it had been defined up till the age of the Internet, was primarily uh, newspapers. I mean, for hundreds of years, and the you know, going back to the founding, that's what it was. And then, of course, radio came along, and then television uh, came along. It's interesting. When I was a reporter uh, covering the Capitol, I was uh, the secretary for the Capitol Correspondents Association. One of the jobs the legislature sort of delegated to us was sort of determining who gets to cover the legislature. In, in other words, who gets to be in the wings of the legislature, uh, you know, watching the activity, or there's press tables actually on the floor of the Senate and the House. And it was sort of my job as a secretary to sort of say, yes, you know, you can do that, or yes, you can. Looking back, I'm kind of going, well, why was it, you know, why was it my job? I mean, wh whose job is it to decide? And in the age of the internet, it's even more so with everybody with blogs. Uh, my wife likes to say that um, everybody with a grudge and a computer is now a reporter. And <laughs> that's kind of the way I look at it. Anybody with an opinion and a computer is now a reporter. And so the whole landscape of what is a reporter has changed. And I'm not sure it has changed for the better. One of the things we talked about before was the sort of the technology, and it's not just in journalism, it's in a lot of fields. The technology of the modern age has outpaced our sort of ability to deal with it uh, morally and ethically, you know, and professionally, how do we handle this? And I don't think certainly the press hasn't figured that out. The, re the journalism community writ large has not figured that out. So I, I mean, there is no, I mean, basically, anybody with an opinion in a computer can be a reporter, and that is frightening because uh, with all its faults, the legacy media, the kind I worked for, like the Olympian and so forth, I write a story and it got reviewed by two or three other people usually before it hit the press, before it hit the, you know, before it was in, you know, distributed publicly. That's not the case anymore. That's where sort of fake news comes in, you know, because people put that out and people think it's real. So, um, I don't know. It's it's a really difficult question as to what the press is anymore. And I'm really glad I'm not up on not there are any reporters covering the legislature anymore anyway. But <laughs> um, which is real and a whole other subject and really sad. But um, I'm not sure that how the, how any of us would handle that. So that's my take on it. David, you want to comment about on that and maybe uh, give your opinion whether WikiLeaks is uh, the press. Sure, let me give, especially since one of the, the comments by students, understandably here, uh, is some, I don't know, unclarity about what WikiLeaks is. Let me give just sort of a brief history. Um, so WikiLeaks was established in 2006. Uh, it set up a whole series of encrypted servers in Iceland. Um, the reason it chose Iceland was this sort of cyberpunk vision of having these data dumps in offshore places that would be, uh, that would, you know, there would be a liberal government that would protect them in terms of what they wanted to do. And um, I got word of it uh, from two different people about a year before it came up and had access to sort of uh, do beta testing with it when it, when it first came up. And essentially their idea was, uh, initially, uh, they thought they would be dealing with financial documents. Uh, the first I heard of it is they thought they would have, especially Asian banks where money laundering was going on, that they would set up a data safe where people could anonymously send electronic documents. And they had very sophisticated um, 
routing methods where it would bounce around through VPN, the vir you, know, uh, you know, virtual network so that you could strip off the IP address. Um, and the testing of that was very good so that they could actually have anonymous dumps. Uh, they set it up and they waited. And you know, the first couple years, uh, there wasn't a lot of sort of headline grabbing stuff that started showing up. Um, and then in 2010, there were what they called the uh, collateral murder uh, videos that went up, which were shocking. Um, you know, how many people here saw these? So not very many people, not, not that many. It was, uh, you know, a, a helicopter attack uh, on civilians. Um, and then there was a paper trail afterwards of people lying about what had happened. Uh, and it was very shocking that this came out. Uh, then later, uh, and those, that was shot in, in 2007, it wasn't leaked until 2010. Uh, and then in 2010, Chelsea Manning uh, leaked an incredible amount of documents, which were mostly uh, declassified or low classification. There was, there was almost nothing in there that was top secret or such. And it was, it was mundane State Department chatter. Um, I did a peer-reviewed article going through and doing analysis of the sorts of things that we learned from it. Uh, you know, a, a very a very small part of it. There was a lot of uh, there were a lot of uh, social science articles that came out of looking at network theory and things. Looking at it um, in 2010, uh, not long after this, Sweden issued a warrant for Julian Assange's arrest on uh, sex abuse charges. Um, he, uh, or sexual assault charges, he was released on bail um, and was allowed, uh, he was allowed to travel. He went to England and decided that he was, you know, not, not going to go. Um, and he basically went from going from his lawyer's estate to moving into the Ecuadorian embassy where he lived until last April. Uh, being granted diplomatic immunity. Now, I mean, one, one important thing uh, left out of that chronology was in the last presidential election uh, in 2016, there were uh, documents from the Democratic National Committee that were leaked to him uh, that were very damaging to the Clinton campaign uh, that were on, uh, and so he'd started off as sort of maybe some sort of darling of the left, uh, by the time he was done with this, he had uh, certainly WikiLeaks and Assange, Julian Assange, one of the founders of WikiLeaks, uh, had a lot of people angry with him on, on both sides. Right now he's uh, in England, he's in the UK, uh, with facing likely extradition to the United States, where uh, because of the sort of secrets that have been leaked, uh, which are embarrassing to our intelligence community, who should be very embarrassed, uh, for the sorts of things we've learned about the military and intelligence community uh, through this. Um, he, you know, he's, he's facing possible extradition uh, to come to the United States. Now for this panel, I think one of the key issues or one of, one of the key things is what does the First Amendment have to do with this sort of case? You have, you know, WikiLeaks, you have a leaker, Chelsea Manning, uh, who went to prison, who is back in prison. Uh, you know, she went to prison for leaking these documents, which she did as an act of civil disobedience. She didn't do much to hide that she'd, uh, that she'd done it. Um, that's one issue, but a whole different issue is, is WikiLeaks like a press if they're publishing this, these things? And can they expect the sort of protections that are guaranteed under the First Amendment? Yeah, and that's and that's a really uh, important concept. What difference does it make if you are designated as the press? And of course, the difference is you're protected by the Constitution. What are you protected from? State action. You're protected from Congress and or local, obviously, any sort of government action to shut you down. Uh, so it, it would make a difference uh, if WikiLeaks was viewed as the press. And some of you might be familiar, and we have a slide concerning a case years ago called the Pentagon Papers case, the Pentagon Papers, where Daniel Ellsberg uh, got a hold of this report that showed that Nixon and his administration had lied about 
de-escalation in Vietnam. It was quite the contrary. He leaked it to the Washington Post. The Post ran with it. The Nixon administration tried to shut it down. They lost on that case. So, and then we're going to talk about that. It, it is, is Julian Assange like Daniel Ellsberg? Is he entitled to that kind of deference and, and uh, stuff? But it all deals with if you are, quote, the press, and as Mr. Partlow indicated, that's broadly defined now to include just about everybody. If you are the press, you have certain rights. If you're not, if you're just on your, you know, I don't know, even Facebook uh, account and say something defamatory, you can get sued on that. I would so just say ahead. one more thing with regard to um, what it, what the First Amendment covers is that in terms of, of being a reporter, it's not just what government can do to you. It also provides you with uh, protections from like libel suit and things like that. You, the standard for <clears throat> most people that are like really high up, that you, most reporters would be writing about, if you're a public figure, very difficult to successfully sue for for uh, slander or, or libel. And um, that's probably the only person at this table who's ever been sued for libel. I am really grateful for that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean it. It's unsuccessfully, I might add. So, but yeah, it, it's more than just what government can do to you. It's what another individual who believes you have defamed them, either through slander, ver you know, verbally, or in writing defamation, that uh, uh, li mean libel, that that protects you as well. So it does make, it makes a huge difference what yeah. the press is. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that right now. There, the main case, the, uh, the landmark case that deals with what Bob was just talking about is New York Times versus Sullivan. And you always have to look at the context of what was going on. This case basically boils down to a libel suit uh, filed by a police commissioner in Montgomery, uh, Alabama, who felt that the New York Times had defamed him by running an advertisement that didn't even mention his name, but the advertisement was to solicit financial support for Martin Luther King and other civil rights activists. Mr. Sullivan didn't like that. There were some inaccuracies in the advertisement. Again, New York Times didn't write it. They published it, though. There were some inaccuracies, and at the time, as Bob was alluding to, the law was such that defamation, libel, or slander that was handled by state courts unless there was some unusual situation. And state law governed typically what we call common law. It's a tort. Uh, in, if individuals did it, the standard was basically a negligent standard, which means you didn't act like a reasonable person when you ran the article. You've got to prove it's false, that it's published, and normally you have to prove there's some damages. There's some exceptions to that. So anyway, Mr. Sullivan sues. And there had been a plethora of lawsuits in the South. Again, CBS News, New York Times, any, any media outlet that, that was trying to report on the struggle, the civil rights struggle. So this is a manifestation of that. So at the end of the day, uh, Sullivan won at trial, got awarded like a half a million dollars, significant amount of money that would have bankrupted most uh, media outlets. New York Times sh did a rifle shot to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court set a new standard in defamation cases. If there's a media defendant, again, this goes to who's the media, who is the press. And as Bob indicated, if you're a media defendant, if you're a media defendant, the burden on you suing, you have to prove that the media defendant acted with what's called actual malice. And that boils down to knowledge of falsity or reckless disregard for the truth a very high standard and, um, and, and, it's, and it's, as Bob indicated, virtually impossible to win. Uh, the press more or less has at least qualified immunity. You can't, you can't get rid of the case quickly because it all boils down to, well, what was the editor thinking? What was Mr. Partlow thinking when he wrote it? What did he know? You know, so you can't get rid of it. These cases can go on forever. There's a famous case dealing with General Westmoreland back in the day against CBS News. That went on for like 10 years. So it's a war of attrition, and only the wealthy can survive that. The other thing I would say, uh, the law is, is such that, uh, and I, I mentioned Richard Nixon, ironically, he handled this, he screwed up a case called Time versus Hill, which basically involved private individuals, the Hill family, 
in long story short, they were held hostage. A lot of bad things happened to them. A play was written about it. Time wrote an article about the play. It, the Hill family sued Time. They hired Richard Nixon. He conceded that the standard, even though these were private people, was actual malice, which normally is only for public figures. Who's a public figure? Well, Donald Trump is, you know, celebrities. You go out and you, you put yourself out there. You could be a public figure, too. So uh, that's the standard, and, and that's, that, that is a very high standard to, to uh, win on. Oh, so let me go by here. All right, so this is a quote from William Brennan from that case, and this goes to, um, you know, what, what we look for in our democracy and, and why we have the First Amendment. We want a uh, un uninhibited, robust, wide open, you know, dialogue, uh, even if it's unpleasant, and even if uh, the government doesn't want to know about it. Now, um, I think, uh, David, you mentioned this uh, with President Trump and uh, his kind of relationship with uh, WikiLeaks. You want to make a comment? This is his, actually, the tweet he sent out during the election. How many people remember this one? Anybody? Yeah. And what he's talking about here is this high burden for anybody, even a private citizen, to win against a media defendant. And the Supreme Court, again, set that standard up to protect freedom of the press, because otherwise you could end up back what happened with, um, with uh, you know, uh, prior to the Sullivan case, it just be inundated with uh, lawsuits. But that's what he's talking about. So. Be aware that what, what President Trump is talking about is basically to overturn the Sullivan case. Don't give the press any benefit of the doubt or any immunity. Uh, go to what President Trump talks about is English libel laws, which is in England, and we have a student here from England. In England, uh, the deal is uh, it's basically this negligent standard. Did you act like a reasonable person? And if you, the, the winner uh, also gets attorney's fees and everything else. That's why the English aren't as litigious as uh, the Americans are. Did you want to follow up on that? Anything you want to say about that? Um, no, I mean, just the other, the other thing I'd add, you know, if you, if you saw Donald Trump's uh, tweet of a day or two ago with, when the Kavanaugh thing came up, he just right, went, went right to libel law. Um, the, other, the other thing is, um, you know, during the uh, during the presidential debates, um, you know, there was this moment where he stopped and said, "Russia, are you listening? You know, do you have documents and all this sort of stuff?" And then the <laughs> then these documents appear. Um, I'm not sure it's exactly clear where these, you know, who it was that got a hold of these these documents and leaked them. But um, you know, Trump well, is certainly part of part of this discussion. Yeah, what's curious about it, and please chime in, is that, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, David, but you know, WikiLeaks, they they don't hack computers. No. I mean, people give them stuff, so they don't write the stuff, but they do vet it to some degree, right? They. they I mean, that would be that that would probably be a, a big critique is how much vetting goes on with the documents. They try. I know, you know, from what I know, they try and vet things and and run things by. Uh, there are instances where they've they've pulled things back, but I mean, if the argument is going to be be made that they are the press, um, they're certainly a different sort of press in terms of the the type of due diligence and oversight uh, that goes on. But in some way, they're like the press. I would argue um, that reporters receive documents from people. They receive leaked documents when, when working on enterprise stories and things. They, they, they get these things and that's the sort of argument I think that, that they would make that I think has some water that they be treated like the press. Mm -hmm. They didn't instruct Chelsea Manning to go out uh, and, and get these documents. They haven't, you know, they've said, we're here if you have documents get them to us. But if you go on the New York Times sign, uh, you know, website, they have a signal account, you know, a, a messaging account that you can do anonymously and things. Uh, they have, they have ways to, to get leaked documents. Yeah, Bob, have you ever dealt with leaked documents? Oh, geez. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, a, a lot, and and so I and I would be the very last person to say that we should muzzle WikiLeaks for using weak, uh, leaked documents um, for for their purposes. I think they probably are under just about any definition part of the the press, and in in at least in the modern the modern era, and leaked documents and leaked information, whether it comes verbally or or in writing, is so important to the operation of the press because there's a lot of people that have really information to just to hold government accountable that should be out there and sometimes they just people don't want to tell you unless you know you grant them my anonymity or they will leak you documents and things like that I was thinking today one of the very last stories I did when I still worked for the Olympian I was getting ready to interview this guy who arguably had violated some ethical things with regard to the state pension system and um, the the whistleblower had come to me and I think Sean you I'm not sure you were involved in this or not but he came to me and he you know told me all of what was going on and so I set up an interview with his boss who was the guy that was doing this and as it turns out the uh, the, the whistleblower knew that I was going to be interviewing his boss the next day, so he went into his boss's office, found the list of talking points that he was going to use <laughs> in talking to me, nice. and made sure I got them when I interviewed him. So that was, you know, very helpful. Mm -hmm. So I, I just think that it's um, anything we do to a fringe, to a bridge, or whatever, a fringe on the rights of the free press is, there was, I'll just say one more thing, this is because the press is, in the 1960s, there was a fellow named Paul Kastner. I don't know, you probably don't know him, but he ran a, ma a magazine called The Realist. The Realist yeah. yeah, you remember The Realist, right. And he described his magazine and his mission as being, <laughs> quote, the fire hydrant for the underdog. And so that's kind of what the press is when it's doing mm -hmm. its job mm -hmm. right. It is, it is that, you know, it provides an outlet, a, a place for people to come. Uh, with information that that really should be out there. Mm -hmm. yeah, you, you yeah, this might be a good time to expand on my first statement that um, the, the the freedom of the spe of speech and the press are very broad. Now, the press is one issue, but there's other issues as well. And from a criminal criminal law perspective, maybe this might sh shed some light on the dilemma that WikiLeaks faces and also the government faces, which is. Um, Okay, sure, this, the freedom of speech is very broad, and there are very few exceptions to this protection. You can't, the government can't choose who the press is. The government can't restrict based on content. Um, what they can do is they can restrict in this very narrow area like defamation. Um, uh, well, the government's yeah, not really restricting there, but they can restrict incitement. They can restrict uh, obscenity. Hate speech is not really even something they can restrict. It's a myth. Uh, hate speech is something that is actually protected. Um, so there's just very few exceptions to it, uh, and it's really the general rule under which this follows. But one of those exceptions is when conduct is integral to civil wrongful conduct, or sorry, when speech is integral to civil wrongful conduct or criminal conduct. And so this is one of the problems that WikiLeaks faces. So you can assume that they're the press because the government can't get in the business of deciding who the press is. If the government gets in that business, you have censorship. But of course the question really is, what has WikiLeaks done? Uh, is, it, is it conduct that's actually partly conduct and partly speech, or is it just speech? And that's one of the issues that they're going to face in the current prosecution for, mm -hmm. uh, for treason and under the Espionage Act. Um, so this, this idea of when speech, is in, uh, when speech is integral to conduct is important. One example might be if you're distributing uh, leaflets or images uh, promoting some kind of criminal conduct like child pornography, that's, that's an issue. How does that relate to WikiLeaks? Is there, um, there are allegations that, um, that they were involved in hacking, although that's disputed, right, David? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that's disputed, but there's, al there are, there's allegations that they were involved in, I think, helping Chelsea Manning uh, uncork the code for uh, getting into the government databases, and then also with the uh, with the 2016 elections, there's allegations that they were involved in. Uh, Julian Assange was, was involved in uh, somehow funneling or coordinating the time of those disclosures. Uh, so, uh, what the, one of the pieces of criminal conduct might be hacking, and another one, another s uh, offense might be a civil wrong of the violation of privacy. 
is WikiLeaks doing more than just reporting or distributing? Have they actually hacked into, uh, or not hacked, but have, have they actually assisted in the distribution of private information of individuals that are not newsworthy, that are, it is not a press function, where they're something like, uh, maybe something like the News of the World in England in 2011, where the uh, big media conglomerate was hacking into phones to get stories. You can't do that even if you're the press. Uh, so it's a, because it violates the right to privacy. So those those are some complications that WikiLeaks is going to face. Yeah, and, and Ernesto makes a good point. You know, in our Constitution, there's only one crime mentioned. It's treason. And uh, and I'm sure if if uh, Julian Assange is extradited, which you, s you say he's still in, he's in jail in England, right? Solitary confinement or something like that. Yeah, once he's extradited, you bet your bottom dollar he'll be charged, in my opinion, with treason and uh, violation How of these other laws that Ernesto mentioned. Can, can non-American citizens be charged with treason? I don't know. Good question. I think I think American, it's espionage they can, but not treason. I don't know about treason. I, I mean, I'm not. I, I don't think citizen. the Constitution uh, limits the charge to citizens. To tell you the truth, I mean, a lot of people think, for example, that undocumented uh, folks here don't have any rights. Well, the Fourteenth Amendment refers to persons doesn't distinguish citizens, etc. So I don't know, but uh, I, I think that that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. I, um, a couple other points I want to make so you all understand. Your Bill of Rights, your constitutional rights are not unlimited, as we just discussed, what is speech, etc. The government can restrict your rights if they have a compelling governmental interest. So it's not an absolute, as we talked about. Uh, like your Fourth Amendment right be free from unreasonable searches and seizures. If you consent, you give it up. If you go to the airport, you're going to be searched, you give it up. Um, uh, and there are numerous exceptions. That's why the law is so complicated, or these nuances. But it's not unlimited. I think it's important for people to understand that, yeah, you have these liberties, but they, they can be and are restricted by the government. And this is through uh, case law or statutes, et cetera, like that. I did want to follow up on one point Bob made, because Bob and I should, in full disclosure, we've worked on a lot of cases together. And uh, I find that what, he, what you said about the importance of a whistleblower going to somebody that you can trust with a story and get the story out to hold the government official or somebody accountable is critical. That is critical. And you have shield laws, right, uh, for, uh, for reporters. And, you know, reporters have gone to jail, uh, you know, uh, rather than give up a, uh, a source. And uh, it's, I know from my work with Bob, it's, it's just critical to have somebody you trust and to tell a client that, hey, who wants to get the word out. They don't, they don't have the, maybe they don't have the resources to sue, but they want to get the word out. You get them to a reporter you trust who, who does a good job fact-checking that, at the end of the day, is really the role of the press is to, is to hold. You, you make a great, uh, the comfortable, what is it? Oh, yeah. There, there's a Jonathan Swift quote um, about, and this ran on the uh, masthead, uh, the editorial page of the Seattle Times forever and ever, and it, the quote is, that the job was to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. And to me, that is one of those things that is just absolutely core to the job of journalism. Mm -hmm. So that's why reporters get into the business, most of us anyway. So this is um, Julian Assange, and uh, you saw him in the, uh, the uh, video, but he, this is uh, one of his uh, quotes, which I think epitomizes what Bob has just talked about. We all only live once, so we are obligated to make good use of the time that we have and to do something that is meaningful and satisfying. This, WikiLeaks, is something that I find meaningful and satisfying, and I enjoy helping people who are vulnerable, and I enjoy crushing bastards. And I, it, it's critical to have a free press. It's, you know, we talk about alternative media and s stuff like that and and how uh, you know in my communication law class we look at the consolidation of the media you know only a few companies own virtu virtually everything so you're looking for alternative media to get the word out you know so that's those are all important do you want to make any comments about that? anybody 
Well, you had said that the, um, there's always exceptions to rules. Yeah. One of the one students in our audience should note that the First Amendment has very few exceptions. It's a very broad-based right. Mm -hmm. Government can't decide who, to, who a journalist is, can't limit content, con content except as to time, place, and manner. Mm -hmm. And so it's really like even commercial speech is starting to become yeah. more protected yeah. since the 70s. It's yeah. become more protected. And then you get to the stage of Citizens United where uh, corporations have right to make, uh, to spend money on campaign contributions. So um, it's getting broader, the yep. protections. That's an excellent point. David, you were nodding your head. Did you want to make a comment about that? No, I was just gasping at Citizens United. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, in that, the case, if you're not familiar, <laughs> basically said that donating money uh, was a f speech. So it, it gets to these, these definitional issues that we've talked about. What is speech? You know, there are certain things that aren't, but the Supreme Court, in its infinite wisdom, said donating money to a campaign is speech and can only be restricted if there's a compelling governmental interest. That's how broad this idea is. Yeah, it is yeah. very broad. Mm -hmm. Symbolic speech, mm -hmm. you know, we talked all about that. So, uh, there you go. all right, so this is interesting, and I don't know if this is uh, accurate, so maybe David can chime in here, but back in the day, you know, during the uh, uh, campaign, President Trump said, I love WikiLeaks. Now, I don't know if this is true. Did he, did he say this, uh, do you know? Arrest uh, uh, Assange? Oh. Anybody? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I would, could be fake news. I could be fake news. <laughs> <laughs> he may not know if he said it. Somebody should Google, Google it. And Google he may it. change his mind yeah. tomorrow anyway. So. Exactly. Who knows? Who I'm knows? sure he said it at some point. <laughs> yeah, in mind. But, uh, yeah, interesting uh, thing here. I mentioned this case. Uh, how many people have heard of the Pentagon Papers case? Yeah, I mean, a big deal. I mean, and then again, I, uh, the reason I have this as part of the presentation is to compare what WikiLeaks is doing with what happened in the Pentagon's Papers case. And remember, as indicated here, this was Daniel Ellsberg leaked uh, the documents uh, that the government had lied about what was going on in Vietnam. Nixon tried to uh, put the kibosh on it, filed an injunction. The Supreme Court said, forget it and uh, actually tried, and this goes back to your point, Ellsberg for espionage, but those charges were dismissed. Um, and uh, that was, uh, you know, Legacy Media, that was the Washington Post, ran that, and there's a movie about that out. Anybody see the movie? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, there's a movie on, uh, what's the name of the movie? The Post. The, okay, there you go. The Post, uh, and, it, and it's all about this, what's happened here. Uh, but it's interesting the reception that that uh, you know in Ellsberg that there was all kinds of craziness going on there. The FBI raided his what was his psychiatrist's office, office right. to get dirt on him and things like that. That's ultimately where the case got thrown out was because they had raided his office and they said, well, that's the judge said that's it, we're mm -hmm. done here. Mm -hmm. So yeah. then he then he walked. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, yeah, very famous okay. case, but it does does set like the precedent of shouldn't WikiLeaks and Assange be given the same deference there. So here's an interesting issue. So I think when you're thinking about issues where uh, law hasn't covered it yet, so WikiLeaks, Anonymous, uh, Edward Snowden, Chelsea Manning, in terms of like, um, can you distribute this information like a, like a press uh, institution and be protected, even though there's no legal case on this quite yet, even the Pentagon Papers is not precedent for protecting Julian Assange, because in that case, it had to do with the New York Times being able to run the story, not, not, the, not Daniel Ellsberg being acquitted. That came later. Um, uh, so the, what you want to you do is, uh, with these unresolved problems, is think, what, is, what, is, what are these new sp speech outlets like? What is Snowden like? What is Assange like? And I think a whistleblower is a very good analogy. So that's why this Pentagon Papers case is important, not because it's precedent, but it forms the base of an argument that uh, free speech protects both the speaker and the right to receive information. Mm -hmm. uh, it's that broad, mm -hmm. both the speaker and the right to receive. So if there are outlets that are doing things like disclosing uh, privileged documents that the public ought to know about because war crimes are being committed or illegal activities, financial fraud, then the public has a right to know who's going to protect them. Uh, that's kind of what the Pentagon Papers, by analogy, would be to Julian Assange, I think, mm -hmm. that he's like a whistleblower. Here's the inter interesting thing. A whistleblower is protected by statute. There has to be a statute, and you're an insider in a company that has inside knowledge. That was Daniel Ellsberg. He worked for the Pentagon, right? He was an analyst for the Pentagon. Well, what's Julius, Julian Assange's status? Is he an insider? 
he, he's not an insider. He's an international actor. So that's, it's different. It's both similar and different to the press freedoms and the whistleblower freedoms. Mm -hmm. That's what makes it such an interesting case. Yeah, David? I, I think um, Ernesto raised uh, Edward Snowden, and so Ed Edward Snowden uh, worked within the national security sphere. Uh, he had a private contractor working for the CIA, and what, five years ago, we'll say? Five, six yeah. years ago. Um, he came forward and approached some journalists and uh, filmmaker, Laura, Laura uh, Portis, and said, I have these incredible documents that are showing unbelievable levels of surveillance that we've now all just gotten used to. Um, you know, in the, in the first month that this came out, it was shocking what was going on. The idea that we could all, at any time, uh, be monitored where we are, uh, our movements, all of these sorts of things. Uh, Snowden went on the run, he's wound up, you know, yada, 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 he wound up in Russia, which is where he is right now, not especially happy about that. And The Guardian, the British newspaper The Guardian, um, with Glenn uh, Greenwald and other, other people, um, wrote very meticulous stories on this, and yet they've been treated very differently than WikiLeaks. Um, the, the idea that nobody went to arrest people at The Guardian for publishing these, uh, these papers is a very different sort of reaction that's happened with WikiLeaks. And WikiLeaks didn't just dump the stuff raw. Um, they take a lot of their things, which is what they, they did very much what The Guardian did. They embargoed stories. An embargoed story is where you take documents and things, you give them to a series of reporters. And uh, about 10 years ago, there were a series of things that I have academic expertise in. It's anthropologists working with the military, where there were documents and manuals that were sent to me, people at the New York Times. It, it wasn't blind CC. I could see who had them, and we were all told we had these embargoed things, we had 30 days to write it up, and we all did, and people published things on them. Um, it's, this is what I find troubling about the Assange thing, uh, or WikiLeaks, is you have, I can understand the argument that Chelsea Manning did an act of civil disobedience and will face the legal consequences. Right, which she did now. If now she's facing these strange ones where it's refusal to talk, she's been put back in prison, which is a whole different thing. To me, that's a really different issue uh, than someone publishing these documents, whether it be this strange, you know, internet thing that's WikiLeaks or a newspaper. Um, functionally, I see those as really similar. And I think that's an excellent point. It goes to what Ernesto was talking about and what Bob talked about. You know, who, who's publishing it? If it's a legacy media like the New York Times, you know, they're, they're the 800-pound gorilla, and, you know, who's going to take them on? But if it's WikiLeaks, um, you know, uh, that organization doesn't, and maybe this is where, as you said, the law has to advance to address whether the WikiLeaks and other similar uh, internet-based sources are going to be treated like the press or something else. I know, I remember I, I was in court uh, recently, uh, in a, not before Judge Dixon, but for another uh, judge so. where a, um, uh, somebody came in with a video camera and the judge said, uh, who are you? They weren't with me, I didn't know the person. They said, well, I have a blog and I have a, you know, a YouTube station and the judge says, oh, I guess you're the media. You know, that's good enough. So um, it, it's, it's, it's a curious, I think a lot of depends on who is publishing it. And it gets to your point, Bob. Go ahead. Well, I think it's really important that as few restraints be put on kind of a definition of who is the media. It is a really slippery slope. Uh, if you start down by saying WikiLeaks isn't the media or the blog blogger who shut up at the at the court hearing, I mean, to me, the First Amendment and the freedom of the press, to me, it's like a sacred trust. It's it's a contract between us and 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 the government, and it's part of a the broader U.S. community. I I just and, and having been the beneficiary, if you will, of so many leaked documents and so much information that really did need to get out. I did a whole series of stories, went on forever in the early 90s about the illegal campaign activities in the legislature that cost the taxpayers millions and millions of dollars. And I wouldn't have been able to do that and myself and a couple of other reporters 
if people hadn't have come forward and provided us with specific examples and specific, I went to one member, there's four caucuses, I went to one member that I knew very well and each caucus said, how much do you think it's costing, you know, how much are you paying? And it turned out it was like $3 billion a year, which back then was real money. And so I would not have gotten that and I would not have gotten so many of the other things that, that I was able to report on over the years without it. And so I really, I am a real, I'm really strongly in the belief that you got to be really, really careful before you start cutting people off. And these alternative sources of uh, leaks and information are so important that they've been dubbed by popular um, discourse as the fifth estate. You know, the, the, the print media and the televised media are called the fourth estate. These alternative outlets that leak information are now called the fifth estate. Mm -hmm. no, and what, I, think what, I think an, another important point is, goes to Bob's point about the importance of freedom of the press and free speech. Our founding fathers, they wrote other, under pseudonyms. They, uh, they didn't want to be outed, uh, so they, they, they hid their identity. And obviously, you know, the, the Constitution that we're talking about was part of a bargain to get states to sign on. It was not, you know, the original Constitution 1.0 was referred to as the Articles of Confederation. The second one, which we know of today, was a deal with the states that already had their constitutions. And they said, okay, we'll, we'll put in these Bill of Rights, really don't need them, we don't think, but we'll put it in there to appease you all and, and it will it'll list these liberty interests. The list will not be exclusive and we'll let the states add whatever they want to add. But I think that's important and especially when we talk about the press and if you're an originalist and you know, we, we're talking about the press, you know, actually typesetting with the printer's devil or whatever, but it's, it's evolved. That's why, you know, in the video we talk about the living constitution. It's got to adapt to whatever is going on. I've often told people that there's a reason why the freedom of the press and freedom of speech and, and the uh, lack of abridgment of religious rights are in the very first amendment to the Constitution. Um, because when authoritarian figures come in, when people like the Nazis came in, the first thing they did is they shut down the media, they shut down the press, they certainly shut down religion and all that. That's why that stuff is so important. That's why it's a sacred trust, is because those are the things that go first when freedom is really under threat. And so. David, did you want to make a comment? All right, all right, so this is, believe it or not, the last slide. Let's give it up, last slide, thank God Almighty. Yeah, so this is a quote uh, from uh, Benjamin Franklin. It is the first responsibility of every citizen to question authority, and certainly, the you know, Bob's experience, Ernesto's experience, and David's experience illustrate that. And that's, you know, we hope that uh, you have learned something and that we're gonna have some closing comments if you'd like and entertain any questions you may have. You want to say anything else, David? Start us off, Bob. Okay, I will tell you a story about a story that a, a man wrote. Uh, his name was Alan Greenberg. He worked uh, in, I believe, Lexington, Kentucky many, many, many years ago. And there was shocker, uh, corruption in the basketball program and uh, at, yes, you know, at, I think it was Louisville, I guess, is in there, and then the University of Kentucky, I can't remember. Well, nobody wanted to touch it. It was like illegal campaign and legislature. Nobody yeah. wanted to touch it because it was such a sacred cow, and you had the booster kind of culture, and you had all of that. Well, he took it on, you know, uh, in his own hometown. He was living there, and it, it was ugly. I mean, he really exposed the, cor the culture of corruption in the program and all that. His car got bashed in, he got spit on, he got death threats. It, it truly was ugly. But he, he persevered and he kept writing and he kept working, you know, and so finally I think it sort of got rooted out. But the thing I remember was he wrote a column about it and because it was a school, this is kind of a, applicable. He said that in journalism, the goal is not to be true to your school, but to be true to the truth. It's the only master worth serving. And that's what I believe is the importance of the 
free press when it operates best, it, it, it is the truth. It, it focuses on serving that master. You got it. You go ahead. I think um, in all this discussion of whether WikiLeaks is the press, I think they're going to win that argument hands down. If they were in front of a court, that's actually the easy argument. They are clearly journalistic. The problem is they're doing more than the press. Mm -hmm. And I'll leave, I just leave that for student and audience questions. David? You know, there's a, a long and important history of, of leaks in this country. Um, you know, Bob, Bob mentioned, uh, you know, important stories that he's, that he's worked on over the years where the only sources you're going to get are from people on the inside. Um, I, you know, I, th I think there's a growing awareness of government corruption uh, and that as long as we don't know what's going on with inside the government, uh, we have a really hard time holding our government accountable. So I think whether it's WikiLeaks or more mainstream press, uh, there is such a vital function to democracy from people uh, taking things that are hidden from, you know, we the people uh, who should be in charge of the government, that this, this can really serve an important function and, and certainly has historically in the last 50, 60 years. Well, uh, I, I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank you all for attending, but we're going to open it up for questions now. Anybody have a question? In the back. Yes, for Mr. Price. Um, do you know if Mr. Assange's mental health has really deteriorated as much as the media has portrayed? You know, all I, all I know is what I read in the newspapers and see on Democracy Now! and other places. I don't have any sort of inside information, but you know, he certainly does not look well. Um, he's being, he's in solitary confinement uh, and has limited access to his lawyers and uh, has the stress of thinking he may be suddenly deported, uh, you know, as part of a campaign stunt uh, for a presidential election or something. So. Mm -hmm. Another question, I know we had some other people. Go ahead, sir. I'm puzzled by the concept of legacy press. And what I'd like to know is, is Legacy Press any more than an organization that is very well funded and very well popularized? And the subtext to that is you would probably agree that CNN and New York Times are Legacy Press, yet we know that frequently they print stories that are less vetted than the average person. So what is Legacy Press? So just for the media, uh, the question is what is Legacy Press? And you, uh, you said, are those simply the well-funded entities, those that are the most popular, things like that. So, Bob? Well, I actually hadn't heard the term legacy media until I talked to Sean as we were setting this up. So my, my answer would be it wouldn't necessarily be those that are the most, uh, you know, well-funded. It would be those that have been, have sort of like a long-standing uh, history, I guess you would say, of being reliable sources of information and I think you know newspapers like the like the Washington Post and the New York Times, Philadelphia Inquirer, the LA Times, Chicago Tribune among, among my others are part of that long history that stretches back really hundreds you know 150 200 years in this country I think that's part of the legacy press as opposed to the current sort of new media the alternative media that goes forward and I don't think it has as much to do with with money as it does with just sort of the history of where they have come from and where they are now so did I don't know if that answered well, your question. Entirely, because as, as, as I said, we have seen even just in the last few months, numerous stories come out of the New York Times and CNN that have within a day or two that, oh, well, that was wrong. But see, that's lack of vetting. And so what makes them more reputable than any other entity if they are not doing their due diligence in vetting their stories? So Can I'm going to repeat the story. I repeat the question. Your question is what makes the New York Times and these other so-called mm -hmm. legacy media more credible given they have had a recently a tendency to write articles that have not been properly vetted so why should they be given any deference does that sum it up basically yeah go ahead David I mean, if, it, if it makes you feel better I'm always happy to not defend the New York Times <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you look at what Judith Miller did getting us into the Iraq war uh, and not really being held accountable and so on 
there's problems with any press, and there's problems with blind, you know, blind spots and all of and all of these sorts of things. So, yet at the same time, I think there's something that can be said for uh, having a newsroom where you have editors who ask about sources and so on. And you know, I I write for the non-legacy press. I write for Counterpunch. I write for, you know, all sorts of places. And there's a different sort of freedom and things that come with it. Uh, but then again, sometimes I'll be part of a story and I'll have fact checkers call, call me from like, the New York Times or someone from the New Yorker on, on something. And I'm always sort of amazed that this thing's out there. So I think there is a meaningful difference where if you have an editor looking over your shoulder, questioning you on things, you can still get it wrong, but I think a lot of the sort of press I write for, um, that's missing, and I think it does create sort of a different dynamic. Yeah, one of the differences with WikiLeaks, for example, is when they receive these huge uh, caches of data, uh, in many instances, or at least one notorious one, they just release all the data without protecting, without vetting, uh, what journalists would do is they would check to make sure that people in the stories that are innocent bystanders don't get harmed by the story, they would protect sources. WikiLeaks just released all the data, I forget the name of the case, but uh, the, the media was ask, asking them not to not to release that, and the, 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 like a legacy media might have an editorial staff that decides to vet it for uh, confirmation of the story uh, and for protection of sources, uh, WikiLeaks doesn't care about that apparently, from what I've heard. Let me just uh, make a point about editors. Uh, in, in following up on your the recent controversy over the New York Times running this article, again, concerning Justice Kavanaugh. You may like the guy, may not like him. But what happened there, it's in the news, is that they left out this, the, this uh, information concerning this new allegation that the woman involved doesn't recall it, et cetera. And if you look at today's news, the the, the uh, people that wrote the article blamed the editors, said the editors took that out. And they had a print of correction today on that. So you make an excellent point. Another question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, this one's just kind of just for anybody on the panel to answer, but I'll preface this by saying that like, I think the job of the mainstream media should be obviously to speak truth to power, hold those you know in the government accountable. You don't you always question <clears throat> everything they say. But in recent years, I feel like that the mainstream media, you know, the CNNs, the MSNBCs, Washington Post, all that stuff, they've kind of become, I don't know, defending the, uh, the people in power. They're like they're not exactly questioning the things that they, they do that much. They kind of just go along with it. So it's like, like saying the president wants to stay the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan or or the administration and they don't really quite question, that, okay, well, why are we still staying there? You say we have these reasons, but you don't quite go into actually questioning. So it's like, but define victory. Why are we still here? That kind of stuff. Do you believe that the mainstream media, as in recent years, isn't quite doing their job of questioning authority? All right, so the question is, uh, do you believe that the mainstream media now is not holding uh, people, government, accountable? It's more engaged in defending the status quo. Anybody want to address that, David? I know you have a thought on this. You must. I think Bob does. Bob? Some. Bob has a thought. Some. Well, I, I, I guess I would disagree with that. I think, the, I think that the mainstream media, of which I was a part for so long, uh, it has... By, it, to get back to your comment, it certainly has its faults, uh, and nobody has more issues with editors than I do, uh, because I just do, and because I want to see my words, my pearls of wisdom printed, right, <laughs> as exactly as I wrote them. But I do think that they have, I think if you ask people that were being covered by the, by the mainstream media, they would not say that they were being treated um, lightly. I. I think that if you look at the broad scope of the media outlets that there are, that they are, by and large, holding people, trying to hold people very accountable. I don't know whether it's more or less than it was back in the day. Certainly on the local level it is. It's not nearly as much because there just aren't that many local reporters anymore. But on the national level, I think by and large they are. 
that's that's just my I mean I watch a lot of news and I think they do a pretty good job sometimes I yell at the TV and say you need to follow up you know you need to ask this question why didn't you ask that you know so it does happen but that's because we're all human beings it's not for any malicious or malevolent reason I don't think okay. let me just follow up on that I do think there is a a loss and Bob alluded to this of if investigative true investigative reporters I mean the 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 I'll call the traditional media whether it's the Olympian or whatever circulation is way down that's and that's why people are shifting to uh, the internet and other online sources but I think and Bob and I have talked about this you know back in the day you know uh, you you could depend on certain uh, reporters digging in and, and getting the story asking the tough questions true investigative reporters which Bob I, I'm happy to say was uh, definitely one of the few that you could trust but I don't see that today I don't I don't I, I, I think it's especially true on the local there's nobody locally that that to my knowledge that does that very, very, and that's because of the way the media landscape has changed. That's because of the internet. And there, back in the day when the legislative session would start, there would be thirty or forty uh, reporters up on the Capitol. Now there's maybe five or six, mm -hmm. and that's just the way it is. But I think the ones that are at it are still at it. Okay. Good. Any any comments, uh, David? Ernesto. Another question. Yeah. Go ahead, Professor. Uh, the panel seems pretty unanimous on classifying WikiLeaks as the press. I'd like to hear you talk more specifically about 2016, where WikiLeaks wasn't simply a conduit for leaked materials, but also deliberately timing the leaks to influence the outcome of the election. That's what I was suggesting. Um, okay, so let me read. I got to repeat the question. Yeah. So the question is, we've come to more or less a consensus that WikiLeaks is probably the press. Your question is, what about in 2016 where they were uh, timing release of information to influence uh, the 2016 election uh, to the detriment of Hillary Clinton, correct? Okay, so who wants to touch that? I could briefly oh, touch want. it. Okay. So um, there's, you could look at this from a human rights perspective, right? Because WikiLeaks is a global actor, not, not, not even a national actor here, actually. They're, their servers are in Sweden, and uh, you mentioned Iceland at the beginning, and uh, Julian Assange is Australian. So what are the international norms that protect WikiLeaks and others? So one of the international norms is in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights is speech, just like we have. But another one is privacy. And so, and also you could argue um, freedom of uh, harassment or, of, or crime. And so uh, WikiLeaks has done a few things that are either borderline on that on that activity of maybe invading privacy. So for example, they've, um, they've made, they, not, not to say that they hacked, but that they've allowed to be distributed people's information that journalists would have protected, thus outing them, thus putting them in danger. Uh, then they had this situation where they, uh, there's an allegation that they were um, uh, coordinating the timing of the, dis of the disclosure of the Democratic National Convention emails during the the, the Trump uh, election campaign. Um, and that's, um, that's different than what a journalist would do. So the question is, is there some other concern that in a human rights sense that WikiLeaks is kind of mar straddling not just freedom of the press? And I would argue you have to look at international law, including the Declaration of Human Rights, and one of them is privacy um, um, and also criminal law. Criminal law where they're actually stepping on the toes of interests to not to be harassed, not to be uh, not to have your life ruined by somebody who discloses your information because information can be life. So that's that's my analysis. David, do you have a? Um, yeah, you know, there's. I I simply I don't know. Like I assume everyone else in the room, when WikiLeaks received these documents from the DNC. Um, and if they held on to them, I know I read, uh, you know, initially there was some sort of timeline that got taken back in terms of what went on. So I, I don't really understand, uh, understand the, the possible culpability that may well be there. I just, I just don't know. Um, but I do feel pretty sure that these won't be the issues that if Assange is, if there's an attempt to extradite him to the United States, it's not going to be over, um, over this. It's going to be over revealing 
um, making making public um, you know, a whole series of embarrassing internal communications of our government. Governments in the State Department uh, showing wrongdoing of uh, private contractors in Iraq, the stuff that came out of the Manning about the, the wasting of, you know, millions and millions of dollars going on with the government knowing about it and joking about it, um, with, you know, cover-up of these kill campaigns and things that have been released in there. Uh, these sorts of documents do present uh, threats to the legitimacy of the government and the government's actions, and that's you know, that is why uh, he'll be brought here. It may well be that, uh, you know, Assange decided to be a political actor and get involved in a campaign and things like that. That's not why he's, he, he would be extradited and brought to the United States. He would be brought to the United States uh, for uh, threatening real political power, uh, not for, you know, putting out documents uh, to influence an election, which uh, in one way or another newspapers do all the time in different ways, probably not to this degree, but. Uh. And let me just add, I, I don't know all the details, but I know that was one of the allegations made against Roger Stone that somehow he coordinated with WikiLeaks and, uh, you know, the prosecutors dropped everything, uh, decided not to proceed with the case against Stone. So that may answer your question about the coordination. Maybe there wasn't there, maybe there was, I don't know. I, I understand that WikiLeaks had already publicly announced that they were going to leak some stuff and Stone passed that information along. So bottom line is that was an issue uh, in, these, in the indictment, I think, uh, with Roger Stone, but the, for whatever reason, he was not prosecuted. But they, it, they've also uh, distributed documents just to embarrass companies and their employees having nothing to do with government corruption. That's, yeah, I, forget, yeah, the I, name, mean, I yeah, forget the name of the case, but... Well, I mean, the bottom line, whistleblowers, uh, you know, are, are quite frankly, are a valuable uh, and, and are, are, are sh should be respected because, especially in companies, if you have a whistleblower, they're trying to... They're going outside because they have no other way to fix the damn problem. And they need to be... Um, it's an ethical issue, et cetera. Go ahead. Yeah. Professor. Um, thank you for this wonderful panel. Um, my question is about the designation of press as well, uh, but it's more like ontological <laughs> in nature, in the sense that hearing this talk, I have more, uh, I'm thinking about more in my consideration of how you know, we as people or personally define what press is, um, but I think I'm gonna leave less certain like I have an understanding of it. Um, and so, Bob, one of the uh, ideas that you brought up that I really like is that we should be broad in our considerations of what is press. And I like the idea of someone showing up uh, with an interest to document and report on something, uh, you know, having that sort of access. Uh, but at the same time, and this is, relates to some of the things you said, Ernesto, uh, both in uh, your, your provocative uh, <laughs> sign-off with uh, uh, WikiLeaks being more than the press. But at the same time, you're also pointing to the fact that they're doing less than what the press would do in their uh, reluctance maybe to vet or certain documents just being published uh, you know, without redaction or any sort of editorial uh, consideration. And so one of the things I'm thinking about is the relationship of uh, press institutions, the importance of some editorial control or figure that can stand in as the, you know, at least the, the point where like integrity stands of this. Um, but then I'm also thinking about this with WikiLeaks with their absence of editorial, leaning more towards um, uh, being a, a, a platform, right, rather than um, uh, a publisher, right? And that this relates to uh, conversations and activities around, uh, at least in our country, the president is, I think, section 30, 230 is what people point to, that gives the, uh, you know, folks like Facebook, allows them to distance themselves from user-generated content and things like that. So I'm curious about the relationship of like WikiLeaks um, as a 
platform versus a publisher? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to repeat that. So your question is <laughs> that, was long, that was a long one, there, brother. Every single word. Well, every single word. No, uh, yeah, I vaguely remember. So your question is basically uh, the, the characterization of WikiLeaks. Uh, are they really the press, or are they simply a p platform like like Facebook? Does it make a difference if there's an editor involved? Should there be one involved? What difference does that make, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So Bob, you want to hit that? I, I don't know quite how to answer the question. I, I think that it's always best when you're, especially when you're writing a really, um, you know, <laughs> controversial material, um, that you have at least more than one set of eyes on it, um, and so that you don't, you know, inadvertently make mistakes. Um, I don't know. I think, I think by and large, they are sort of a platform, but you could look back and historically that newspapers way back in the day at the founding of the country they were platforms as well I mean they were platforms for a point of view and um, there were Republican newspapers and there were uh, Democrat newspapers for a long long time and so you wanted to read the, I think it was Chicago Tribune, famously, the Dewey defeats Truman when that was a Republican newspaper and that's the outcome they wanted. And so up went the headline. And so I think they, to a certain extent, the media is always sort of both a platform and a news distributor. Um, and I do think that it's important for news distributors in a platform sense. Even Facebook is trying to cut back now on you know the stuff that just clearly from their algorithms and all that you know fake news if you will or hate speech or whatever they're restricting so I don't know that answered your question but I think I think we've always it's always been that way it's always been a platform newspapers and new media always a platform always a, an influencer of some sort let me, let me just insert here uh, I think it's important you make a great point about Facebook private organization you you sign up you agree by contract certain conditions right that's purely the government is not involved with Facebook now the problem is the government wants to be involved with Facebook and it's telling and now so it's it's forced Facebook to edit stuff now Facebook as you just said was intended to be a uh, neutral conduit you know post whatever the hell you want to post right now once they start to edit they start to own it. And I think there is a, a problem, a slippery slope that it, it's one thing just to, hey, and there's a case, and I think it's a basis for that provision that, I think it was Yahoo or somebody, that hey, we, we're just posting, it's not us. We don't, we don't check content, we're just a conduit here. But once you start to edit, you own it. And then that exposes you to all kinds of problems. Aren't you suggesting, Dustin, that because of Section 230, which basically grants immunity to the platforms from lawsuits, uh, or from from that yeah, that I'm, I mean, and I don't know if it applies to something like WikiLeaks uh, because of its you know uh, global reach. Yeah, it seems like the, the the question is suggestive that maybe WikiLeaks might have an immunity like that because they're just a platform like Facebook. Uh, I'm, I'm less or concerned about okay. immunity and more, uh, well, although I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on it, yeah. uh, and more about uh, how it affects our understanding of what the press is. Oh, the function of the press, okay. Yeah. yeah, because that would be one really good analogy to distinguish WikiLeaks from the press. What it's really doing is a, a being a platform to distribute information, not editing <laughs> for a very good reason, just like you know, Facebook would be, would be a platform. Uh, and that kind of like distinguishes it from the <laughs> press. Is that what you're sort of saying? Uh, but it, but it's doing both, like you said, in your examples of them doing more than the press right. and having this sort of control over when or how they would release the uh, information. Yeah, that that could be that that factual analysis could be the basis of a whole landmark case distinguishing WikiLeaks as something that should be protected. But of course, there would be the issue of what have they done wrong <laughs> as well. <laughs> Let me just interject. I do think it's important the content of what is being distributed. And we've, we've discussed it's very difficult to rein in the press or to restrict free press or free speech. But again, the, the government can do it, and especially if it's a national security, if it's deemed like a national security issue. Can I get an example? Well, that's, I'm, let me just say that's what uh, uh, David is talking about. He's going to be extradited, not for the, the shenanigans with 
uh, the Clinton campaign. It's going to be because he disclosed things that the military and national security, however that's defined, doesn't want out. This huge uh, media conglomerate called News of the World in England was shut down basically because they hacked into phones to get stories from a, a crime victim, a 14-year-old crime victim, to get the story first. And that's a, there's a little bit of WikiLeaks kind of like glimmering there. The media can do journalism, but media can also commit crimes. And they were shut. The whole big company was just shut down. So, in, in, in another question yes. in the back. Uh, we, let me take uh, one over you, sir. This question is very similar to his, but shorter. Good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to repeat the question. So. Uh, I'm just curious. This question is to everyone up there. How might you legally define what the press is? Okay. So the question is, how might you legally define what the press is? I guess, you know, let me just start out. I would certainly look at historically how it's been defined. I think, you know, there's certain assumptions and, and court decisions have afforded protections to certain people under the, under the uh, idea that they are the press. Uh, I think uh, as Bob, and I'll turn it over to Bob, whoever, I think now it's very broad, very broad. I think you talked about reporters and the need to protect reporters. Hey, and I, as I said, uh, if I have a, uh, a camera and I've got a uh, you know YouTube uh, a, a channel, I'm a reporter. Go ahead. No, I would just agree with that. I think I'm not sure there is a sort of a legal definition of what the press is. Certainly not in the current environment because it's exploded so much in the last 10, 15 years. So I. I would. I don't have. I mean, I'm not the legal guy. You would. <laughs> they're, they're, you would, you yeah. would know more than I would. Well, they're, they're and I always operated as, as part of the le quote unquote legacy media. So, there was there any question? There can't be a definition of the press because that's the slippery slope. There you go. Government right. can never define the there press. What there can be is this nuanced analysis of different kinds of press, and go and it just got, goes on forever. But once the government gets in the business, of defining the press, that's the that's censorship. Yeah. I'll, I'll add what Ernesto said. Yeah, that works. But that doesn't mean that WikiLeaks isn't doing other things. Just, yeah. just saying. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Yeah, uh, Professor Stadler. Related to that, uh, I was wondering if you all would comment on the current administration's efforts to sort of delegitimize the mainstream press and bolster some of the uh, press we wouldn't ordinarily think of, you know, members of the public would ordinarily think of. So the question is asking us to comment on the current administration's efforts to delegitimize. De 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 Thank you. <laughs> well, it's Late, uh, uh, the main uh, the main uh, uh, mainstream press. Uh, who wants to? It's okay. a it's a strong arm tactic uh, that President Trump is using. Uh, Bob, a half hour ago or so, has made some sort of comment along the lines that fascist administrations come in and shut down the press. Um, this is not shutting down the press, uh, but it's taking clearly factual stories that are out there that are displeasing to the to the president, and and allowing him to just not respond to them in this in this very bizarre, surreal sort of way, where any story that's counter to the narrative, no matter how factual it is, uh, just gets labeled as fake news and then goes on, and it's. Uh, it's undermining uh, logical and rational discussions throughout the country. It is exceptionally dangerous what he is doing mm -hmm. because he has labeled the press, however you define it, as the enemy of the people. Absolutely. That's exactly what Joseph Stalin did in Russia. Those are his words, enemy of the people. And to the extent that you take an institution as fragile and uh, as strong but as fragile and vulnerable as the press is and attack it in that way it really really is dangerous and because it can easily be taken away by somebody like like Trump for example I mean I think he would just as soon do away with all the press but yeah no I I totally I, it's it's awful what what's what's going on and to the extent there is fake news, 95% of it is coming out of the White House every day. So, I mean, the man has been found to have told 12,000 lies since Inauguration Day. Hello? I mean, it's dangerous. And people, having said that, though, I will say this as well. It's really incumbent on all of us 
as consumers of news. It's not a one-way street, the news media to all of us. We have to be wise enough in, in selecting what we want to watch, what we, not what we want to watch, but knowing that we're going to have, that there are legitimate sources of news out there, imperfect, imperfect though they may be, that we have to be, we have to be on guard all the time for it for just this kind of thing. Otherwise, it will be taken away from us at some point. Let me just add to that. Uh, I would just say sometimes the press shoots itself in the foot. I mean, this, this recent thing with, uh, again, Kavanaugh and the New York Times. Uh, and I would also say that um, this is, you know, this administration, th th its efforts to rein in the press, it, it pales in comparison to what happened way back with President Adams and Jefferson <laughs> in enforcing the espionage laws, arresting editors, uh, shutting down newspapers. Same thing happened under President Wilson when they resurrected the espionage laws to uh, support World War I. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not new, it, it, and uh, w whether you like Trump or don't like him, it's not as extreme as what happened back in the day. Any other questions? No more. Seeing no more questions, Bob has a comment. I Go just ahead. want to say thanks to Sean for putting this panel together. Sure. I think it was thank really you. good, no. and I really, really appreciate it. It's a great discussion. Well, and I do want to thank, thank all our coming. panelists. They're volunteers. I got to tell you, I, 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 I told them they were going to get paid <laughs> by somebody. Uh, it wasn't me because I'm married. I have no money. We got so uh, <laughs> the. Uh, so, but I, I do want to, uh, again, thank Professor Dustin Zimmel for the excellent video, uh, uh, Professor Will Stradler for providing uh, some feedback on the PowerPoints and also the, um, uh, the Constitution. And I want to thank all of you for attending. I think this was a great opportunity for you to learn about the Constitution. Thank you. Thank you.